Hello and welcome to the fourth video in the latest iNow series. So far we have installed the flight controller and set it up and we've set up the basic settings on the flight controller software so that we're ready to go out and fly for the first time. I would always recommend before you fly an iNav capable craft is that you do the standard setup that you would on any plane. Make sure the center of gravity is in the right place, do your high five test to make sure the control surfaces are working in the right direction and also flick it into one of the stabilized modes so angle or horizon and rock the plane from side to side just to make sure that the control surfaces are moving to correct that uncommanded movement. So the way I tend to do it is I rock the plane from side to side for the ailerons for example and the wing that's coming up you should see the control surface go up as well and sometimes it's easier just to kind of put your finger over the control surface while you rock it side to side and to feel the pressure of the aileron pressing on the underside of your finger as that wing rises. It's also handy to make sure that you can arm everything on the bench and that the GPS is getting a lock. All those green things on the right hand side of the GUI need to be nice and green in order for everything to work. If any of those are red then that's an indication that you've missed part of the setup and you need to go back and check something. So in the first flight what we're going to do is just check that it's all going to work and that the servo mid positions are right for straight and level flight when you're in manual mode. So I personally like to do my first test with an iNav capable craft just in manual mode and just pretend it's a normal craft without any iNav capable stuff at all. So take off and fly as normal, but rather than use the trim buttons on the radio to trim out any bias, maybe there's a bit of aileron needed, maybe the ele elevator needs to move slightly. The way you do it is you fly the craft straight and level and flick the servo trim mode on for a couple of seconds and hopefully that should have worked. And what it's doing is it's storing the servo positions that you've got the craft in as the default servo positions, those midpoints that's in the servos tab. Now if it hasn't worked, you can do it again. And then if you like the way it's working, then when you land and disarm the craft, those new positions will be stored. Again, have a look in the documentation for full details of how the mode works. The other thing that's useful in this first mode is once you've got it all trimmed out for manual and you're happy that's working is pop it into angle or horizon mode and just watch the attitude of the craft. I tend to find the biggest problem is usually the nose is going up or down so set it about cruise throttle so somewhere you know around mid throttle just below mid throttle is perfect and what you're looking for is, is the craft sinking or rising. If it's not flying completely level and there's an excellent chance that it won't be then just make a note whether it's going up or down and then when you've landed, go back into the graphical user interface and just change the amount of offset. If you remember, we did it at 10 degrees originally, and you might need to drop that down a little bit, or you might need to increase it if you find that the craft is dropping. It's a slightly iterative process. I believe iNav are trying to work on something that would make it easier to set this in future. Once that first flight's done, then you have proved that the IMUs, the gyroscopes, the accelerometers and all that goodness is working and that the correction is working fine too. And you also know that you have manual mode to come back to if in any of the subsequent testing something goes wrong and you need to take control. Second flight then for me, I try and fly, in a, it can be manual, angle or horizon, doesn't really matter, but enable nav altitude hold mode. Now you probably have to set that up in your modes tab, but if you flick that on, then in hopefully as you're flying around, the craft should try and keep the same altitude. So get a reasonable height, stick it into something like angle or horizon is typically what I do, and then I just fly around without bothering too much about the elevator, just using the aileron to roll from side to side, just to see if it corrects for that. I've not had one yet that doesn't work properly. If you have any weirdness, first thing I'll probably do is double check that the GPS has a good lock and also cover any barometer that's on the flight controller in foam to stop any stray whiffs of air being read as a change in altitude. So now we know the gyro, accelerometers and the barometer are all working. It's time to go on to the GPS. Now the GPS mode uh, is one that you just need to be a little bit careful of. You need to make sure that you've got a solid GPS lock before you fly and I wouldn't trust GPS or any of the fail-safe pieces until you've gone through three or four GPS return to homes and it's worked great every time. Most of the problems I hear from people with iNav are because they tried to do something crazy and fly a very long way away and they hadn't done enough testing with the GPS return to home and when they activated it the craft didn't end up back where they started. 
So it's worthwhile spending a bit of time not only to test that the system is working perfectly on your craft and the GPS isn't glitching or anything weird happening, but also just so that you as a pilot know what to expect. So the way I would do it is take off in any of the modes, get to a reasonable altitude, not too far away, so that you can take control of it again, taking out the GPS mode and fly it back to yourself if it starts to do something weird. And I would select to both have nav position hold and nav altitude hold set up at the same time. We already know that nav alt hold works from the previous flight. That should maintain the altitude, but nav position hold should hopefully fly it in a big circle around the GPS coordinates that we were at when we flicked the nav pos hold. So take it up, flick it into nav pos hold that's also select nav alt hold at the same time and hopefully you'll see it fly a nice circle. By default the radius of that circle is 50 meters so it's a hundred meter diameter circle which should be easily capable with a maximum allowable roll angle and you should be able to watch that flying around all the time and take your hands off your sticks and have a big grin on your face. If it doesn't then it's probably something to do with the GPS and it might be time to start looking at things like black box logs and also making sure that the GPS is far enough away from things like the power system and it isn't getting any interference and it's got a nice clear view of the sky. If that all works and you're feeling particularly brave, then you could try a nav return to home. So this time I'd take it, I'd put it back into manual horizon or angle mode. I'd fly it a little bit further away, again, well within line of sight range, so I can take control of it if it decides that home is over in Venezuela. Hello to all Venezuelans, by the way. So when it's at a reasonable altitude, flick the nav return to home mode switch, and hopefully you'll see the craft immediately start to bank and try and fly back to you. If it doesn't do that and starts to do something weird or starts to take off in the wrong direction, immediately pop it out of nav RTH mode and fly it back to yourself and have a look at what's going on with the GPS. But to be honest, if the nav position hold circle test before it's worked, in the nav return to home usually will. Once you've got that done, then you are pretty much set up. I would recommend, again, just testing a few more nav return to homes, uh, just in different environments, and just making sure that you know what to expect when you flick that switch. Because nav return to home, as we saw in the previous video, is what I would recommend that you select your failsafe to, and that should hopefully mean that if there's a hiccup on the craft, it's going to execute that return to home and fly then above your head couple of things that I would check and we'll look at some of the specifics in the next slide but I would go through and have a look at all of the settings in iNav that are to do with fixed wing that start with FW underscore if you type set FW underscore in the configurator it will show them all and if you search in the iNav documentation for the one that you're interested in it'll explain what they actually do check all those out make sure they're set how you want them to be and also check the nav underscore ones are what you want them to be as well again i'm going to give you some examples in a second but i personally would recommend going through each of those particularly when you've upgraded the craft because things are changing all the time in the software then i'd go and configure the on-screen display the on-screen display in iNav is changing all the time. Uh, I usually have it in exactly the same way I have the layout for things like beta flight with the addition of the distance and return to home arrow at the top of the screen as well. At the moment, there isn't that kind of map functionality that's in things like Minim OSD, but hopefully we'll get that soon. Other things to recommend, I'd potentially turn auto launch on always. Um, it's available as a mode and auto launch is quite nice. It allows you to throw the plane into the air and in theory iNav will detect you've thrown it. Um, I'm laughing because it doesn't always work and then engage the throttle and take off. I personally would reduce the detect times um, and the lag for the throttle coming on. Uh, sometimes if you haven't done a particularly good throw, by the time it tries to detect and correct it, it's all over and it's on the floor. Last couple of things in this list, I try flight and test fail safe. When you are happy that the nav return to home is pretty bulletproof and working well, and you can turn your radio off on the bench and you get that little red parachute as we saw in the last video, then the last real test is to go into the field and make sure that you've got lots of room, make sure it isn't too far out of line of sight, and then turn the radio off 
and hopefully it'll start to execute a return to home. Once it started to do that, you can turn your radio back on, it'll reconnect and you can take control back of the craft and land it, usually with your heart pounding. But I would always recommend that you test the failsafe works in a real life environment as well. And then you know if ever there's a problem in the field, you've got that extra protection from the iNav system. And the very last thing then is tune the PIF controller. I have a complete video on what PIFF is all about, why it's different from PIDs and how you set it up as well. The proportional and integral are exactly the same as the standard stuff that you'd set up on another flight controller. Too little or too much proportional will cause the wings to waggle. Uh, if you find that you're flying along and one wing gently dips and keeps dipping or the nose pretends to dip or go up, or in a turn, the nose is dipping, there's a chance that that's going to be the integral is too low. And the feed forward part of the PIF loop is about how much of the control is also put into the correction as part of the PIF loop. Again, have a look at that PIF video, go through it in far more detail, and also explain how to set it up as well. Uh, the PIF stuff in iNav is pretty forgiving, and most planes will fly pretty well with just the standard settings, particularly if you have set up the model using one of the presets. So here's an example of some of the things that I regularly check in the CLI, and these tend to be the main ones that I check. There are others that I always just double check there isn't something wacky going on in the latest version, but things like the cruise throttle is set to 1400, so that's just below mid throttle. That's probably gonna be right for most people, but you might want on a windy day to have that a little bit higher, particularly if the wind is in a direction where the craft might have to fight it to come back to you. Minimum, maximum throttle are fine. I potentially, again, in particularly windy environments, I'll probably increase the max throttle to something like 1850 or 1900. Maximum bank climb and dive angles are all very safe there. I'd potentially increase those to maybe 30, 35 for bank and climb angle. And the dive angle, I wouldn't get that too low. Um, I don't want the plane rocketing into the ground. Loiter radius, that's the one we talked about just a moment ago. That is the radius for the nav pos hold circle that it's going to fly in the sky. By default, it's 50 meters. That can go all the way up to 100 meter radius. That's a 200 meter diameter circle. That's pretty big. But if you've got a very big plane and you don't want too much um, roll angle, the maximum roll angle in the navigation stuff, then you might have to push it to that bigger circle. Last couple, we talked about potentially reducing and changing the stuff in the launch detect. The two things here, the first one is the launch detect time is, I think it's in milliseconds, it is 40 milliseconds. I would probably reduce that to maybe 20 or maybe even 15, uh, so it detects it a lot faster. And personally, I like to reduce the launch motor delay from 500 milliseconds, which is half a second, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it can mean the difference between it rescuing it and climbing it into the sky and it plowing into the grass as it starts the engine. I would probably drop that down to kind of 200, 250, 300, just so that the motor comes on a little bit faster once it's detected that it's been thrown. So hopefully that's been interesting for those of you for the iNav setup so far. So hopefully for those of you that have been watching along, you now have an iNav wing uh, that you can fly, that the GPS modes work, you know it's all going to be fine, the failsafe works, and it's going to behave in the way you want it to. In the next couple of videos, I'll have a look at some of the more weird and wacky features. And we'll also start to have a look at things like the Waypoint tab in the iNav software that was introduced recently and talk about how you use that with a flight controller. If you found that video useful or like the content, then please hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you want to go the extra step, you can become a Patreon of the Painless 360 channel and help provide support for what I do here. All the videos created here are put into playlists, so if you're interested in a particular topic, have a look at the playlist, and they all are organised in there to make them easier to use. If you're not sure if there's a video for your particular problem or topic you want to know more about, then add Painless 360 to the Google search term that you're interested in, and that should find the video, article, or content about the particular thing that you're interested in having a look at.